Well, I am here with Stephanie Wolf, um, and she has um, been referred to me by Julie Riesler. Um, and um, in the short time we've had a chat over here, she has been of generous heart and spirit. And so I wanted to click record. I don't want to miss anything that um, she has to share. She um, uh, wrote to me about the American Brain Tumor Association. And her brother has a compelling story. He's a long-term survivor. And um, she's got, um, uh, she wrote to me that uh, he's her, uh, he's her hero, and um, and uh, I want to hear more about that. Um, and uh, 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 the links um, uh, uh, the links. Uh, block um, through um, uh, from his diagnosis yeah, yeah the links to your work oh uh, the links to your work I'll put in the um, your extraordinary work I'll put in the um, uh, video description below this. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, um, what can you share with me um, with either the, where would you like to start? Would you like to share with me the American Brain Tumor Association uh, resources or your brother's compelling story? Where, where do you think this? Well, actually, I'll start with you. Okay. And I went out on a walk a few weeks back and uh, Julie is, Julie Riesler, who you mentioned, was married to my husband's cousin. So we're family, oh. sort of. And while I was getting ready for the walk, I thought I'm going to see what, I'm going to go into one of her podcasts, randomly picked a podcast. And there you were. Oh. So it's fine. It's very interesting to me that somehow people that need to connect seem to just connect. And I do believe that there's greater powers that be that point us in a direction. When I was listening to the podcast, I knew as she was about to say what you were diagnosed with. I mean, I felt like I could put the words out there. Glioblastoma, GBM. It has become something that um, is one of those light bulbs. When I hear it, I want to reach out to the people to see if there's anything that I can do to help. I was first introduced to the ABTA 14 years ago. I was actually teaching, and let me know if this is too lengthy, because I do know how to condense, I just usually don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was teaching a yoga class and my phone kept going off and I thought, well, people that I know, know that I'm teaching, the phone keeps ringing, I should check it. And I pick up the phone and there's a message saying, your brother went down at work, EMS is there, they can't revive him. My brother is the epitome of health. I mean, he's he eats right, he works out. Um, he just has a very clean life out in LA. And I finally got a hold of my mother and she filled me in on what was going on. And I flew out the next day to LA. He was in um, the ICU. And they said that he had had a stroke. And I said, no, we, we need to delve deeper. And in doing so, over the course of the next few days, we found out that what he indeed had was a glioblastoma, which is stage four brain cancer, one of the worst diagnoses anybody would ever want to get, one of the worst. And um, I remember the doctor saying, we've got to move quickly. We don't have time with this. I went in and explained to my brother what we needed to do. The first thing that they wanted was an away craniotomy. 
And I literally stood there and held his hand in the pre-op until he went into surgery and was right there when he came out. The doctor that did the surgery came out and he said, we got it all. We, we got it all. And the, it, it was such a great feeling, but as you discover with GBMs, they're astrocytomas, which simply mean that they are, um, they have tentacles that grow out. They're like, you know, in, in other words, if you were to take table on, a table with salt on it and try to scoop up all of the salt off the table, if you leave one speck of a particle, it has the opportunity to reignite, so to speak. So my mother, I think, was still in that shock mode and basically said, well, how long does he have? And the doctor looks at her and says, well, you know, typically... 15, 24 months, it just depends, but it really depends on the individual. And I looked up and I said, well, this isn't gonna happen. Um, what can we do? And go to the computer, type in brain tumors. The first thing that popped up was the ABTA, American Brain Tumor Association. I immediately contacted them. Within two days, I had a packet in my hands with a dictionary of all the terminology that I would need to know with the opportunities that were available. And again, this was 14 years ago every month something changes. So you can imagine between then and now all the different advancements that have come about. But when my brother came to, I explained to him what was going on and that they got it all. And my brother is brilliant. And I don't say that to be nice. I mean, he's brilliant. He's, he was on his way to the MCAT and missed the deadline. So took the LSAT for the heck of it, got into law school, went to law school, not for me, went back to the MCAT, got into med school, went into med school, did oncology research, and then decided it was a little too depressing. And so he switched over and got his MBA. So he's, he's got this mind for brilliance. He reads incessantly and he said, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna treat this? And one of the directions we went into were, were researching or was researching um, clinical trials. The issue with clinical trials is they only want you if you have a you know, 95% chance of survival because then their studies get funded. And I mean, basically that's kind of how it works. If people are surviving, money comes in and they can continue the research. So we really push to get him into a study. At the time, it was called the ICT-107 study where they were extracting for the first time dendritic, putting in, um, extracting white blood cells and working with the dendritic cells, which has come so far as of today. And we did that. At this time, he is, I believe, one of two or one of three still surviving and thriving from that study. It stopped at the third level of the clinical trials because of funding. Mm. But I feel like if it had continued, we see a lot more in that area. Yeah. So anyway, that was my intro to both the glio world and to the ABTA. So these, um, this, I mean, that's extraordinary. Uh, so the, the dendritic um, trials, so can you say, that's a vaccine therapy, right? Well, it was essentially, yeah, it was essentially a vaccine. What they felt like was if they could get the dendritic cells back into attack, let's say the queen bee, to stop all of her little bees from progressing the disease, um, that, that, I mean, that's what they were after. Yeah. And this was, I mean, it's a phenomenal study. This was, at the time, two of the most prolific doctors in this research field happened to be at Cedar sinai in my opinion. Dr. Keith Black and Dr. John Yu were the two doctors that we worked with. Keith Black was the originator of the gliadol wafer, which was the wafer they would insert into the brain to emit the, the chemotherapy mm. over a period of time. And Dr. John Yu is one of the top researchers. Did he get any of that? I, um, the gliadol wafer? Yeah. No. 
He just did, I, I think you said you were doing chemo last week. He did the team Timador or the team of Yeah, yeah. Right. So um, did he have, um, I've got, um, you asked earlier on, um, I, I think before the call um, began, uh, before we recorded, where are the tumors? The, my tumors are um, in my, I've got a butterfly. I've got, um, uh, whether they're connected or not, um, two tumors, one um, um, on, uh, they're both in the frontal lobe. And one is in the um, uh, speech circuit. So that's the left frontal lobe? Left frontal lobe. Yeah. And um, there's a part that it gets my hand. So when I had, um, I, after radiation therapy, um, I had um, swelling. And the question was whether or not I had pseudo progression versus progression. And um, I never had a surgical resection. Um, I went straight to radiation therapy. So you had edema, was that edema within the brain? Well, that was, that was in the brain. Um, and I went straight into radiation therapy. But did that, I don't know how much the edema was. You didn't have any like subclinical seizures or anything that it was compressing. It was just some slight. Well, it was from the radiation therapy itself. And oh, uh, okay. the radiation causes edema in the brain. Yes. Um, and uh, 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 from three milligrams decorate, decron, um, um, uh, with complete uh, uh, paralysis um, 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 uh, 25 milligrams of decadron. Okay. Now, a, a vast and has allowed me to bring that down to 10 milligrams, um, you know, uh, of Avastin, to, to 10 milligrams of Decadron. It, it allows me to use less, but I'm, um, I'm calibrating around word block and seizures. So I still have activity. And I'm having a heck of a time um, with sedation on my seizure medication. So I'm now, I'm now on Depakote. Yes. And um, um, Keppra. Depakote and what? And Keppra. Oh, and Keppra for the seizures. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I was. I was in um, the ER, lot, you know, the weekend before for the seizure to optimize my seizures. And then I was just in last night. I came home last night, uh, having had a blood clot to the lung. So that brings you, you know, brings you up to speed with my, uh, with my course. Wow. Um, there's been some, with the Avastin and the Decadron and the Kepra. I mean, Kepra is probably first line of defense um, for the seizures for most people. I do want to caution you to, if you do change the Kepra to a generic, it is my understanding that the generic is not a, it's not equal, equal. The generic is not quite as strong as Kepra itself. So I just, it, one thing you might want to double check and make sure that if they ever did say we can put you on the generic, you might need a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. And 
there. I, I'm just saying from experience. Um, but I do understand the speech and the blood clot issue. Are you, did they put you on any blood thinners or no? Oh yeah, I came home on um, enoxaparin, sub-Q. Yeah, so just be careful with that. Wow, you've got, it's yeah, nice I've, how that all balances. I've got a, like a, a balancing act. So I'm very curious about what your brother went through with the wake surgery, because you know that allowed him. Um, I, when you operate on the brain, the brain, I, you know, um, interestingly enough, um, doesn't have pain receptors, so it allows you to operate on the brain painlessly. But um, there is. Um, going into the brain, so, mm -hmm. uh, and there is um, the weirdness of that. I'm just curious, yeah. you know, how they do that. So um, what they did was they removed the, the skull. They, they took a portion off from about here to behind the ear. So they, they lift and remove the skull. And you know that brain tissue, it all looks like tofu. The tumor, the brain tissue, it's, it's all tofu. So what they do is they begin removing what appears to be the tumor at the same time that they have him awake, as in an awake craniotomy. And they're, they're giving, they're talking to him and they're giving flashcards. <laughs> and at one point they showed him a picture. This is my brother's sense of humor. He's amazing. They showed him a picture of a watch, which happens to be a Rolex. And they said, do you know what this is or what this does? And he says, I know what that is. It means you make a lot of money <laughs> uh... to afford this watch, um, but it tells time. And then they, they asked him something about um, a toaster. And I think they showed him a picture of a toaster and asked him what that did. And he was having to say, yes, it makes toast but they were working with at the same time speech and recognition and recall. And that left frontal lobe affects your ability to reason. I mean, you know, it's, there's so many other things that are involved. So they're asking questions with numbers and counting and um, subtracting and who is the president currently and really think something from every aspect, every walks, walk of your life, something that, is involved everywhere. And he was like, yeah, they did it for a couple of minutes. And when I talked to the, the surgeon afterwards, it was like, no, this was half an hour, 45. I mean, they were, the whole time that they're maneuvering through, they want to know, are they hitting the spot? And when he couldn't talk, they would lay, you know, lay off of that area. Um, if he couldn't rationalize. Okay, great. Where did he have his surgery done? Cedar sinai LA. Okay. Oh. Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's fascinating because not only are they saying what is five minus five or what is five plus five, and of course they did it much more, you know, with counting backwards from 97 or 92 or throwing things out there. Now, on a good day, I would need a paper and pen, but he was able to, to do all of this math and pull up all the information. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it was all at Cedar sinai phenomenal group of doctors. Amazing, amazing. Uh, that's, so did he have any post-course complications? He had, I think the biggest issue for him was remembering medicine. For the first few weeks, I would get up every three or four hours to get him to take a med or to follow up with him or just to check on him. And um, shortly thereafter, I had to come back to my family um, in Texas. And he was, I don't think he was taking it, his meds as religiously. I mean, it makes a difference. You take that Keppra at the exact same time every day because it has to stay in your system. And he did have one grand mal seizure um, but at that point, 
this was just post-surgery. At that point, he was in an environment that was very safe with sofas and cushions, and, um, and he did well to bounce back after that and then got his medicine stabilized. So he really understood it's very important to keep that regimen. Okay. Mm, amazing. So what is he on right now? Um, what, what's his regimen right now? Um, and how often is he checked? Well, oh, that's a very good question because with COVID, he was pretty much staying at home because of this compromised immune system. And he didn't want to go to the hospital to get MRIs, but typically three to six months, every three months MRI. And um, we're on with a team of doctors that check in with him quite frequently, mostly because he's a 14 year survivor. Yes. So a lot of these doctors up until COVID were bringing him to their convention saying, here we go, let me have somebody talk to you. And um, that this procedure, this program has worked. Um, so now he's on, he does take seizure meds and um, I think recently blood thinner. And they also wanted to put him on a cholesterol med. And he said, <laughs> why do I want a cholesterol med? Is my cholesterol going to really affect me before this affects me? We're both in that less is more kind of ballpark. Yeah. Um, why does he take a blood thinner? Why does he take what? Why does he take a blood thinner? Because he had some issues with blood, blood clots as well. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. So that was a recent development. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Hmm. Can we shift right? I mean, that's an extraordinary, sure. extraordinary story. And uh, um, do you know if there any, uh, if we can shift to talking about the ABTA? Correct. Yes. Um, and uh, which stands for the American Brain Tumor Association, and uh, the resources they have. Perhaps we can start out by. You know, was that the place that you first, there are resources for clinical trials. Was yes. that a resource for clinical trials or? Not, not when we first started. It wasn't, they have what's called Trial Connect now, but that just came about in more recent years. Yeah. What I really relied on the most was a 24 hour care hotline, somebody to call. And as a caregiver, someplace to go. From a caregiver point of view, you know, the patients in the hospital being taken care of by everyone. From a caregiver point of view, where do I turn? Where do I find information? Who do I trust? How do I know what to do? What do I do as a caregiver? How do I, am, am I doing too much? Am I not doing enough? How do I get by day to day? And that caregiver hotline was a resource for me. For the individuals, this Trial Connect program, and then we put on, I actually put on the 5K races in this, well, I, and with other people at this point in the Southern region. And we raise monies for the purpose of providing that caregiver hotline, providing the clinical trial resource lists. We have a peer-to-peer -peer or a, um, a group of people that will mentor whether they mentor the patient or the caregiver, we have that availability. And we also have the fundraising that we do for these 5Ks and golf tournaments, et cetera. We really wanna get research. We wanna get in there and get this research so that we can find the cure and make a difference when somebody gets that diagnosis that we then say, here's a treatment for you and you as an individual or you as somebody dealing with this specific type of tumor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. It's, um, that's noble work. It's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's very near and dear to me. It, it, for me, it's completely volunteer. We always need volunteers. If anybody wants to volunteer, we would love to have you. Um, we just finished our, our, in May, we finished our race for this year. Yeah. So I'll put, I'll put a link uh, 
down below in the video description where people can sign up to volunteer. Absolutely. My team is the Wolf Walkers. I invite anybody that wants to feel a part of a team to join me, or you can start your own team for these fundraisers. If you would like to be a mentor or be mentored, I would definitely suggest getting in touch. It's very simply abta.org to link onto their website. And there's just a plethora of information there for people to check into. Mm, mm, mm. So do you have any um, sense from your viewpoint? I've activated my um, uh, medical networks um, from your sense. You know, um, in many ways, there's a, a complementary richness that comes from um, the healthcare support community, the caregiver support community that is a depth of richness that um, is invaluable. Do you have any sense with this, um, where this, from your viewpoint, where this research is going? Well, you know, interestingly enough, once a year I would fly to Chicago where ABT is located and meet with, it's a, it's a patient and caregivers weekend that we would get together. And in that weekend, we would have all the presentations from where the monies were donated and all the latest research. But unfortunately now it's been two years because I haven't been there since 2019. Um, so I don't know what is currently happening, but ABTA would have a link to who they fund and why and where those research projects are going. Does that answer the question? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, I don't wanna just speak off the cuff esoterically because research as we know changes constantly. Yes, 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 yes. Well, so Steph, I, the, um, this has been an, an invaluable, chat, I, uh, um, uh, I'm inspired uh, mm -hmm. and comforted um, by the possibilities of this, um, by your um, brother's long-term course. And, um, and your loving compassion and your, uh, your heart. Um, and in this purposeful work. Is there anything else you want to say in closing? I absolutely do. I want to, I want to thank you for putting out, you said over 180 entries into, um, I don't know what you called it, into your blog, mm -hmm. into your... Living Well From Within playlist. Living Well, yes. Because... Now, my brother is, is an independent. He doesn't have a family around him, nor is he close to us. He actually didn't make a move to come back to Texas, number one, because of the doctors that keep him alive, and number two, because of where healthcare is and what happens if you leave a state versus entering a new state with a, pre, you know, with a condition that you already have. So I just wanna make sure that people understand it does not have to be a solo journey and neither should it be a solo journey. There's resources, there's people. And if you can connect with somebody who's willing to connect with you, to talk with you, to give you those virtual hugs at this point, do it because it's, it's so critically important to take this journey as a community. Yes and to know you don't travel it alone. And just, you know, to be with somebody who knows this, who understands this, who experienced this, there's, there's a, a certain warmth in there that on days when you can't get up and be yourself, we know, we get that, we yeah. understand, we love you for you. Yeah. And, there's a community out there that wants to help, 
that's willing to help. And that's, we're here with open arms, ready to, to be there. If for no other reason, just to say, we're, we're here to listen. We're here for you today. We love you. We appreciate you. Well, I, those are extraordinary words. <laughs> um, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your, for your loving presence and, uh, and sharing your wisdom with us. So thank generous. you. I, I so appreciate you having this platform. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.